Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second MicroStrategy Connect. If you hadn't heard, MicroStrategy Connect is the new live series that lets you go behind the scenes with microstrategists across the board, from technology to education, design and support, everywhere to keep you up to date and informed. It's been really exciting so far, and we're pumped for today's chat. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask away, and I'll get to them at the end of our session. It's going to be a good one all about dossier design, always a hot topic. All right, so to get started, let's do some introductions. I'll start, I'm Lauren O'Connor. I am director of the um, education development team. So the team that writes all of our amazing classes and I'll kick it over to you, Jeff, to start. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jeff Corsell. I'm the vice president of user experience and design and the chief designer for MicroStrategy. And Kevin? Hey everybody, Kevin Rooney, uh, senior sales engineer based out of Brooklyn, New York. Amazing. All right. And to kick things off, Connect Series always starts with a little lightning round uh, before we get into the good stuff, just to keep you on your toes. So a couple of fun questions. Here we go. What is one product that you think is designed really well? So uh, I'm going to go with the, uh, the Sphero BB-8, the little droid. Uh, we, my kids are just old enough, four and two, where they're starting to understand that dad is obsessed with Star Wars. So uh, this thing is invincible. Like the software is really good. It's easy to control, but it's fallen downstairs off tables. They throw it and it just keeps going. It's, it's, a, it's a really fun, really fun product. Nice. Am I allowed to pick dossier? <laughs> uh, uh, how about your second favorite? <laughs> my, my, my other favorite would be uh, my 80 something inch stand up desk that I have in my home office that I that I bought during lockdown. It's mechanical, it's got perfect elegance. I love this thing. That's great, gotta have a good home office set up. All right, what is your favorite restaurant of all time and where is it? I'm gonna go with, uh, with a French restaurant actually in Boston. It's called Les Poliers. Uh, oh. it's, uh, it's just incredible food. It's a wonderful combination of like food and, and service. And if you're ever in Boston and you're just looking for like a really decadent meal, uh, I think Les Ball, yeah, you can't go wrong with it. Nice. Yeah, it's really good. I'm a big burrito fan. So there's a there's a little town called uh, Carborough right next to Chapel Hill in North Carolina. And they have a nice little place called Carburitos. I love that place so much. I also love a good pun. <laughs> super, super fun series. It was really good. But this Friday is just like the, the best day in television in a long time because we have I think the premiere of the first part of the last season of Stranger Things and the first two episodes of Obi-Wan Kenobi oh, so right. I'm, I'm gonna be on yep. yeah. <laughs> for me it's uh there's a there's a film on Netflix about uh football club Barcelona it's called take the ball pass the ball absolutely legendary team great documentary great, nice. great soccer team well, I know what I'm watching this weekend. <laughs> All right. Are you an iPhone or an Android person? I'm an iPhone person, but I will also admit to uh, quite proudly, I guess, that I was one of the uh, dozens of Windows phone users back when that was actually a thing. <laughs> I did have one. Uh, there, there were a few of us. It was, uh, it was a fun phone. But yes, I'm definitely an iPhone. Yep. And I've graduated from the BlackBerry also to the iPhone. <laughs> uh, and then I do love my, uh, my red tablet as well, my amazing iPad. All right. And our last fun question for you all, though, these are all fun, but can you describe MicroStrategy in three words? I'm going to go with enterprise intelligence everywhere. I, I think it's really core to identity and who we are and, and to the customers that, that we partner with to build these amazing applications using our platform. Nice. Mine would be a comprehensive, <clears throat> comprehensive analytics platform platform being the keyword because you can do so much with MicroStrategy. And I just think that that is absolute keyword of the three platform. That is a fantastic segue into our question. So let's get started into the technology. So this session is going to be focused all on dossiers and application design. And we're, to, we're going to go through many of the most frequently asked questions from our customers. It's always important to think about where you want to start with dossier design. Think about the users of the applications that you're building and their usage pat patterns. So Jeff, Kevin, when you're with customers, where do you start building? When is there just a canvas and what do you think about or encourage customers to think about? 
It's a good question. Um, so I think we're going to have slightly different approaches, and I think both of them are really valid depending on the situation. Uh, when when my team engages with a customer, we approach designing an application in Dossier the same way that we approach designing a new feature for uh, MicroStrategy for our platform. So we really embrace our UX process and our methodology. So the first thing we do is we try to interview the actual users of the application at, on behalf of the customer. Uh, so to understand who they are, who are their personas, and what are the core jobs to be done they have, right? The second thing, which is always important, is we have to understand their data. So you have to be able to take a look at the information and the data that they're going to be using. In a lot of the cases, the customer might have a very fixed data set. Uh, so we immediately might get into dossier design in that case. But in other cases, they don't really know which data sets to use. They have a lot of data in a lot of disparate places, a lot of disconnected things, maybe it's a set of applications that they're trying to reimagine right into a mm -hmm. single application experience. And so in those cases, we start with wireframes. Our, our preferred tool is Figma, uh, but we'll work to understand those core jobs to be done for those personas, design some wireframes, do some early ideation, some testing, iterate on those designs. And when we start knowing that we're getting close to a really solid application experience, that's when we'll go to the dossier authoring experience and actually begin to start bringing in data and design that, uh, that application. Nice. Yeah, I, I was a two-time customer of MicroStrategy, and so uh, I've I've grown up being a data junkie through and through uh, as a data analyst and plenty of other roles in that space. So for me, I just get excited to that part where we get our hands on the data. How many <laughs> columns can you give me? How many thousands or more? How many rows can you give me? And what can you give me to play with? Um, I do all of my idea creation just using uh, dossier through the authoring experience and just iterate and iterate and iterate and try to be creative. Think of five different ways to visualize one business problem, see how my peers respond to it, go back and change things again. Uh, and so for me, it's always a very heavily data driven process that I go through uh, as I'm designing. And I'll show you some examples today as well. Great. So slightly different approaches, but at the end of the day, it's about those end users and how are they going to use that product, which I know, Jeff, when I worked with you to write our Dossier UX class, that was a really big theme of just getting started. And so my next question for you all is, what about consolidation? Do you ever work with customer customers on a consolidation effort? So for example, a lot of our customers have hundreds or even thousands of reports. Are applications the way to consolidate? And how do you go about doing that? Yeah, so I, I think they. this is something we see um, very, very frequently, right, which is sort of just the proliferation of applications, dashboards, objects, data sets, where it gets so noisy and cluttered, right, inside of a customer environment. And what they're really looking to do is you know, during the, the course of a workday for any of their constituents, right, there's so many different signals, right, that they're hearing. There's so many different applications they have to go to. And so every other app that they have to go to to solve a problem or to do their job is just more noise and more inconvenience, mm -hmm. right, during their day. So a lot of our customers will say, we have this group of things and we want to do is just sort of reimagine this as a single application experience. And sometimes it's a standalone application they're looking for. Sometimes it's net new. And sometimes what they're looking to do is embed uh, MicroStrategy inside of another application they have, but use it as that single system of truth uh, to create the experience they need for their users. So to really get started, you need to understand, again, I'm always going to go back to those core jobs to be done for those personas, because if you really understand what it is they're trying to do, you can identify maybe there's some pieces out there that they're jumping between to get that job done, and you can consolidate those. But it's also equally as important to understand what are the things you have in your ecosystem today that they're not using. Right. So what are the things that are just added noise or clutter or, or something they have to hoop they have to jump through to get to that solution that they're really after? Yeah, that's something that I've experienced a lot in, in successful dossier implementations as a customer was finding uh, that we had to eventually go and take a step back because mm -hmm. some of the most popular uh, dossiers that were being used people would create a copy of it and then they would do something right. to personalize it in whatever nuanced way. And you'd find that some of the heaviest users actually had 10 different versions of the same dossier. Mm -hmm. And as we move into a world where it's more application app centric, it's really great because there's a lot of built in features that prevent people from having to go recreate the wheel, you know, whether it's our bookmark functionality mm -hmm. or anything like that. Uh, bringing them to that one ecosystem, I think, is huge. But also with platform analytics, if people do tend to run rogue, 
there's a lot of great creativity going on out there too that you can actually benefit from. So a couple yeah. of different ways. That makes a lot of sense. Got it. So when you're working on paper or Figma and outlining the design for this application, we have a lot of visualization features um, that can really help to highlight those main KPIs or just make day-to-day -day operations easier. Can you all briefly highlight some of the top features you see integrated into applications and add a little bit about, about the value of each of those? Yeah, I can actually show a couple of examples if that's okay. Great. Please. Uh, we've, got, we've got a few great applications here to show. Uh, this one I really, really like, and it does show a lot of great new features. Uh, we've got panel stacks now. So you can see over here on the right that you're able to toggle between the two layers. Uh, you've got the panel stacks. You've got your new time series visualization that we have integrated into the product now. Uh, you've got information windows. And so you can see here, you can actually pop up an information window mm -hmm. and effectively like drill in to get another layer of detail around that granular point. A uh, couple of other great examples here. Uh, my favorite, <laughs> vertical scrolling. <laughs> this is how we all consume content on our phones. This is how we consume content when we're reading on the internet. And to now have the ability to just rather than splash things across numerous pages to be able to create one sort of splash screen, I call them one pagers, where you really have a lot of that content uh, just in one stop shop in a way that's sort of uh, organically native to how people read content across all of their devices. And then just little tricks like being able to use attribute selectors so that instead of creating panel stacks or instead of creating multiple visualizations, that you can actually just swap out an attribute on a single uh, visualization so that you can just sort of get nuanced uh, in that regard. Uh, my favorite new feature, though, is actually the format panel. Uh, <laughs> we've radically overhauled that. <clears throat> and one of my, you know, there's there's a, you know, Bart Simpson at the beginning of The Simpsons is writing the same phrase <laughs> over and over and over again. <laughs> and mine is never accept the defaults. <laughs> so even if you're just looking at one scatter plot, just to know all of the granularly nuanced ways that you can really make that your own in just an easy to find uh, yeah. revamped uh, format panel is, is my number one, that and vertical scrolling. Yeah, I, those are really good ones. I, I'll highlight a couple that are probably a little less obvious, um, but for one of them, for example, is the ability to hide and show things versus mm. a web device or a mobile device. It's a really powerful uh, uh, capability that, that Dossier has now, where a user is actually able to get a single dossier that they can consume in web and mobile, but get a different experience on them, right? So uh, one example, if you, if you see what's on the screen here, we have the static left navigation. Uh, and this is a very powerful web experience. This is an app, right? This is what enterprise uh, customers build. They build applications, they don't build dashboards. Mm -hmm. And so this is a great consumption experience on a tablet or, or in a web browser, but on a mobile device, this is gonna be a little bit challenging. So you have the ability to hide that navigation on a mobile device. You can even hide other visualizations, you can change layouts, uh, and you could either introduce a new custom navigation or mobile, or just rely on libraries out of the box navigation capabilities, right? To just go in and, and use the table of contents from there. Uh, so that's one feature I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan of. Um, and I think another uh, equally is, is uh, you know, he mentioned vertical scrolling, which is in incredibly powerful. Um, but when you combine some of these features together and you use responsive grouping, uh, mm. that also gives you a new level of control over the breakpoints and how this works. It's not just about hiding and showing things in mobile, but it's also about what is the correct layout? How should this respond when it goes from a browser to a tablet to a mobile device and the dossier authoring experience gives you control over all of those things. Yeah, I actually think we have an example of this uh, same dossier that you see on the screen now uh, rendered on a mobile device. And it's gonna show exactly what you described, which is the ability to suppress that navigation on the mm -hmm. left mm -hmm. and to then adopt all of the native functionality that you have through uh, the library app on, on an iPhone in this case. Yeah, that's great. So really, you can 
design once and deploy everywhere with that flexibility of hiding certain things and um, changing navigation to library or in the app. Um, yeah, that's fantastic to see of really just that flexibility of what we can do with a single dossier. Um, and, you know, I have to plug education here, Kevin, when you're talking about all the different visualizations, we have a class that's just all of our visualizations and how can you format them and how can you use them? Um, and I do have a quick question. So you briefly mentioned information windows. Can you talk a little bit about hyperintelligence versus information windows? When do I want to use one or the other? So there's a couple of key considerations uh, to, to decide when you're going to use a hyperintelligence card versus when you're going to use an info window. I think the first thing is they're not mutually exclusive. So mm -hmm. you can use both, right? Um, but uh, I think that they solve slightly different problems, right? So a hyperintelligence card is bringing you information about something that it sees either in your dossier or the great thing about hyperintelligence is that it's not bound to a dossier, right? So you can design one hyperintelligence card. You can use it in multiple dossiers. You could use it in documents through web browsers. You can use it in Outlook and in Excel mm -hmm. and just through Google Chrome, just looking at websites. Uh, there's a lot of places that card can go. So you, you know you can design that and deploy it everywhere. And it brings intelligence to users in other applications and other dossiers. But it's always going to answer the same question, right? Which which is it's going to bring you information um, based on the keyword that it highlighted. Uh, a hyper intelligence card because of that is extremely portable uh, mm -hmm. and it can deliver you know, really information to the very edges of your user base. Whereas an information window can answer different questions, right? Mm -hmm. So an information window is going to have a very specific trigger that's designed by the dossier author. And when it, when it, materializes, it can bring data visualizations, it can bring grids, it can it can link to other things, you can jump from an info window and go drill into another dossier or another page. And you can control the size hyperintelligence cards, you can control height and some of the layout capabilities, but an info window, the number of different things you can use experientially for it are quite high. And it ranges from what Kevin showed, which was a small uh, overlay that was showing uh, some information mm -hmm. there about uh, about salary, but it can also do something, for example, it could be a tutorial. So one of the things mm. we see customers do a lot is to show their users how to use the application that they've built in MicroStrategy. They have a little question mark, and when you hit it, it's a full screen info window that's with callouts to all the different controls and all the functions that that page has so that the user can can do guided, uh, guided discovery, right? So th there's a lot of different uh, applications that you can um, really benefit from the use of info windows, but you really want to understand about there's a principle we use a lot called uh, next best action, right? And okay. the way we typically design info windows for customers is what is the question that the user is likely going to ask when they see this mm. piece of data? If you can answer that in an info window that comes up and maybe that's a launch pad to go do other activities, you, you've just added so much value to that user. Yeah, absolutely. And without having you. to take up Canvas space as well. That's right. I can show you an example of some hyper as well, if that's helpful. Yeah, that would be great. So we can see the difference. Um, so we looked at this earlier, but this is an example of an info window, which I kind of see also as sort of a, a drill or a zoom in to a certain data point in this particular mm -hmm. case, right? So you're going one layer deeper. Uh, with a hyper card, I'm out there doing whatever it is I'm doing on a daily basis out there on the web interacting with all sorts of different websites, looking, doing research, et cetera. But with Hyper, I can then use thresholding to underline a keyword, mm -hmm. give you that call to action that says, oh, this one's green. You need to take a closer look. And it's effectively like a KPI card, you know, like a cheat sheet that gives you a sneak preview of what is out there for an individual noun. Mm -hmm. The idea being for me is, is that that next best action, I always hope, is that they then take that as an opportunity to drill in to the library environment, click mm -hmm. on one of these buttons up here, and then suddenly you're interacting with a dossier uh, application experience, again, that could have info windows unto itself and just create yep. that whole sort of gateway to get people engaged and brought into that environment that maybe they otherwise weren't going to proactively click on in a given day. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And, and seeing those examples is really helpful. Um, so I'm going to go back a little bit to visualizations. And I'm curious, how do you all know which visualization would be best for a data set? Are there any rules when selecting a visualization? Or does it really depend, again, on the job to be done? 
I mean, I always go back to the jobs to be done, right? <laughs> yeah. But I think that there's a combination of, of probably three critical factors here. So the first is you have to understand the persona, right? Different personas have different levels of sophistication, right? When it comes to being able to interpret visualizations. So some visualizations I think are very universal. I think everyone understands a line, uh, a line chart or a bar chart. Those are very easy to understand or a pie chart, though I'm not personally a fan of pie charts, but they're very easy to understand. Um, some individuals actually, you know, we found have difficulty understanding certain types of visualizations, right? Area charts, for, for, uh, for example, sometimes can cause confusion. Mm. Sand key diagrams, right. incredibly powerful, but you have to know when and how to use them, which gets me, I think, to the second point is you have to understand the data set. Right. The, the data set is not always going to lend itself to certain types of visualizations and the intersection of knowing the persona and their sophistication, the data and the third uh, piece of the puzzle is what are they trying to do? Right. What is the job to be done? So knowing is this something they need to trend? Is time a factor? Right. That's going to lead me to a different set of visualizations than if this is basically an aggregate number, right? Mm -hmm. Is it something that's being totaled or looking at it in an aggregate? So uh, I think understanding those three things are really going to help you choose the right visualization. And in some cases, in authoring experiences, there's no harm in throwing your data at a visualization and looking at it and yeah. saying, hey, does this work? No, okay, let me yeah. try a different one and yeah. just starting to swap visualizations out until you have your aha moment, like, yes, this is this is the Sound, one. That's exactly sounds like what Kevin's approach. <laughs> yeah. Iteration is the key for me. You know, yeah. I, I when I'm given enough runway in a, in a project life cycle, the first thing that I often do is I, after we figure out all the questions that they want to answer, we've honed in on what data we're going to use. That first pass dossier, because it's so easy to do no code development and just mm -hmm. analyze and just think like an analyst as you're building, that I'll often build the first dossier for myself. Mm. And, and then the second one I build after I learn my, you know, what I learned, maybe I got an insight that I wasn't expecting to get anything like that. Then I go and I built it for my customer. <laughs> and so, so it's, it is that iterative process yeah. and, and also, you know, knowledge exchange with your peers. Uh, one example, the heat map or the tree map is one, it's three dimensional, right? You've got size and you've got color and then you've mm -hmm. got a categorical field. Um, you know, sometimes people respond to that and they think it looks beautiful, but they maybe sit there and think for a second. Is that telling me the insight that I'm looking for? Mm -hmm. You know, you can get that same three dimensions, for example, through a scatter plot. Size being one metric, being an axis, you know, uh, color being the other axis. And then you actually still have those three dimensions, but put in a simplified way. And so I always yeah. do start simple, get ultra creative, and then see how people respond to that and often dial it back a little bit and find some mm -hmm. sort of in-between solution. Yeah, that's great. And one thing I love about dossier design is that it's really easy to iterate. You can just right yeah. click on a visualization and choose a new one and, and see what works for you. Um, so I want to go back a little bit about navigation. One question we hear a lot is when do I use the in-page navigation versus library components or the table of contents? Um, I think you were showing with the US economy analysis, one example there. Do you have any thoughts on this, on the user navigation and the overall experience? Yeah, so library out of the box comes with an incredible user experience, right? And all of these, you know, we talk about, you know, no code application development, right? The consumption experience in library, it gives you all of the core functionality you need for your applications navigation, as well as other powerful things like the filter panel and collaboration and sharing and export. It's all built in already. So in a lot of cases, we really do recommend just deploying it right out of the box and leaving the navigation to our built in components. And the reason is that a, it's already been through a lot of usability testing. You don't have to try to figure out, is this working? Is this going to work for my customers? Uh, and then secondly, it, it doesn't take up any screen real estate. All of these yeah. menus are on demand, right? The navigation is on demand. Uh, so, you know, you can use every pixel of your screen to convey data, right? And uh, that's one of the principles that we use a lot 
uh, when we're designing with our customers uh, is basically the, the notion of digital ink ratio, right? We're trying to make sure that the majority of the pixels on any given screen in your application are there to convey information and data and are not there to, you know, hold a static navigation in place that only mm -hmm. offers value when the user wants to move. Uh, it's also worth noting that there's other ways that you can navigate in Dossier aside from just accessing the table of contents. Uh, on a mobile device, for example, you can swipe, right? Uh, even in web, we support keyboard navigation, so you can jump from one page to another. And Dossier has inside of it navigation that you can build that doesn't need, again, to occupy space. So some of those mm -hmm. things, for example, like contextual linking, where you can click on a value in a visualization or a grid or a KPI, and it can pass the context of what you're looking at, plus everything you filter on in the filter panel to another page in that dossier or to another dossier entirely, right, and bring that experience there. However, there are really good cases where you might want to yeah. use an in, in-page navigation. Sure. I think part of this comes to what are you trying to design experientially? If your company, for example, is heavily brand centric and they have a look and feel to all their mm -hmm. internal applications, you might want to replicate that right by building that uh, that static navigation that's that's going to stay on the page. Um, equally you might want to have more control over the look and feel of the dossier in general. Maybe you're embedding it, for example, right? Which yeah. is which is a very powerful uh, capability. So in those cases, you, you can absolutely make that navigation on the page. We talked a little earlier about the ability to hide and show. So again, you can design a custom mobile nav that only appears on mobile. So the web one is hidden and it goes across the top instead of being vertical. Uh, or you can, in that dossier example we saw, just, just hand it back over to library for mobile experiences. It's entirely up to the customer, but they have a lot of options in terms of configuration and the overall UX and what they want that dossier to look like and feel like in terms of that application experience. So just those are the, I think, the, the key considerations. And yeah. it really just comes down to customization and where is this dossier living? If it's going to be standalone, if it's going to be on its own, uh, or it's going to be embedded, absolutely, you can design uh, those custom nabs. But if you don't want to do that, library comes with amazing uh, UX out of the box to handle all of those scenarios. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I go. I go with uh, whenever possible. I try to use the core functionality yeah. built into to library and dossier, uh, largely because it's the same navigation for every single dossier, right. every single application you build in a dossier. So that means that if you get comfortable using it one time, you're off to the races, <laughs> whether you're on a tablet, whether you're on a smartphone or whether you're on a computer, yeah. it's using all of that same functionality exactly the same picks up where you left off when yeah. you jump mm -hmm. across devices and awesome. it just feels like this one cohesive unified experience. Yeah, makes sense. There's no learning curve. You just pick it up and keep navigating. Yeah. Um, all right, Absolutely. and so when when you're building all of this so with panel stacks and navigation, how does responsive design work? I know we touched a little bit on this. Is there anything I need to do as I'm designing if I'm trying to have this application work on a mobile device? Yeah, so the great news is that dossier is responsive out of the box, right? So mm -hmm. just just the nature of, of building a dossier and then opening it in library, it will respond to whatever form factor you have. It'll automatically determine the breakpoints and it, and it does it just based on how you've structured the page. But I, as a designer, and I'm sure Kevin's the same way, I don't like to turn over the experience to anything anytime, right? So I want I want to have more granular control over that. And yes. what the dossier authoring experience gives you is the ability to create responsive groups. So you can you can take objects that you put on your canvas, you can combine shapes and images and data visualizations and text boxes and all the other things that you've put there. And you can look at them and say, how do I want these to, to respond when it goes mobile? And you can create responsive groups around those things to determine mm. exactly how they're going to render on the page. Now, if you can combine that with the power to hide and show things on a mobile device, yep. that really gives you and you yeah, have really distinct experiences between mobile and web, but it's also consistent right between the right. two of them. All you're doing is making sure that that mobile experience is going to be the best it possibly can be. Now, again, all this functionality that we talked about navigation wise and things has already been imagined in mobile and it comes right out of the box with library. But if you want that custom app experience, you can use responsive grouping uh, to make sure that when it gets to mobile, that it's a it's an incredible mobile layout. Yeah. 
Yeah, I use that with uh, KPIs always at the top. I'm always grouping them in sets of four. So I get these two (laughs) tags right at the top. Yeah. And it just always looks great on an iPhone. No, absolutely. And you can do clever things too. Like on the web, for example, you might have a grid with 20 columns and that works really well, right? But when you go to a mobile device, a 20 column grid is just not remarkably consumable. (laughs) But what you can do is take the same grid, hide it, when it goes to mobile and just give a five column one that just yep. summarizes yep. that data, right? So uh, you can get really, really creative with with how you want that mobile experience to render. Yeah. And one thing I want to note about responsive design is that when you're designing on your you know, computer, you can click a responsive design button and actually see what it looks like on a mobile device. So it's not yeah. like you have your phone here or, you know, and you have to go back and forth, you can actually see it. Um, and yeah, that grouping is really powerful if you want two visualizations to be together. You just group them and they're at the top or wherever you want on your canvas. All right. So let's say I've built this amazing application. It's got info in those panel stacks. Um, I've grouped everything correctly for mobile. Um, So what if I now want to embed it into my organization's own portal? Are there some considerations I should take into account when embedding? There are. Um, So if you're going to embed, which a lot of our customers do, and and we really recommend exploring, right, embedding, because it allows you to to basically build applications, right, in library, but Mm -hmm. deploy them inside of existing portals or applications your organization already has, right? So a couple things you want to keep in mind. um, One of them, of course, is how much of of libraries uh, out of the box functionality do you want to expose to users, right? That's going to determine what you want to do with the library toolbar. So there's things you can do now with uh, library applications, right, where you can customize not only which features are on and off, but also the look and feel of of, of Mm. the the library logo and a bunch of these things to to determine, um, you know, what is it going to look like when it's embedded inside. So uh, if you're going to turn off things like collaboration services, or if you decide you want to turn off, uh, you know, sharing these things, you, you can decide to completely suppress that library toolbar or maybe leave it there, but style it so that it looks and feels natural inside of where you're embedding. Uh, Another key consideration is also going to be navigation. So typically, if you're embedding, there's going to be a navigation scheme that is outside of the dossier that's controlling access to not only the dossiers inside of that embedded scenario, but also to other areas of of the native application that the the customers built. So in those particular scenarios, you want to make sure that you're aligning the ability to use that sort of outside navigation to control which dossiers you're going to. But equally, you need to be careful about using features like contextual linking. So Mm. if I can click, for example, on a contextual link in an embedded dossier and it jumps to another dossier, right, or another page, and that page is somehow represented in the outside navigation, you want to make sure that you're finding a way to sync the navigation state so that the user doesn't get lost, right? So just by clicking around that they wind up in a different area of your portal, but the portal's now navigation is not reflecting that. So the, those are a couple, I, I think, really critical um, um, considerations. And there's also different ways that you can embed, right? We have our embedding SDK that gives you a lot of power over how you're going to customize that experience. But now equally with with library applications, you yeah. can do a lot of that through a GUI interface and, and control that experience using things like content groups and themes. So it's really, uh, you have a lot of options, uh, but it's uh, dis- regardless of which path you decide to take, it's incredibly powerful to embed uh, dossiers inside of existing applications. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, embedding is always something that's super powerful because it extends the reach of the data to more users, which we always want to do. Um, all right, so um, I have a couple of good questions to end on. I'd love to get both of you to chime in on this. So many times customers ask questions around govern self-service or ask how they can give an appearance of self-service in a way that they as an organization can still control. Uh, What would you recommend for this? I have an example I can show you actually. Perfect. Uh, (laughs) We we looked at this dossier a little bit earlier. It's uh, a use case that I built for asset management, uh, something I have experience as a customer uh, working in. And, you know, uh, I've worked a lot of data visualization jobs in my career, and so I have an obsession, arguably. (laughs) Uh, But we have to remember one important thing, which is that a grid is also a visualization. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the most popular implementations that I, I did in my previous firm. And you look at this and you think, well, that's very simple, Kevin. There's a lot of white space on that screen. 
but that white space is a call to action to the to the user to fill it up. And so this is all predetermined, but a person can go in without engaging the authoring experience mm -hmm. at all. You're 100% a consumer persona here, and you can go through and select which attributes and which metrics you might want to quickly build on just an ad hoc grid. Um, it's a very common use case in financial services. Uh, there's a love for the grid. And, 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 and I think that we should embrace that, make it as easy as possible, make it as inviting as possible. And you'll notice what I always do is I put it as the second page. So for me, if I get them to come to this, success. Yes. Even if they wanted to go and then quickly do their self-service ad hoc as well. Yeah, and that's a really, really powerful example. And then if you combine that with some of the other things you can do, you can create really compelling self-service scenarios, right? So in Kevin's grid example, I could add a set of attributes and metrics that I want to analyze. And I can then go and save that as a bookmark. I can mm. give that bookmark a name. And then I can completely change my, my columns, my attributes and metrics around and save a completely different grid and give that a name. And now I have these two bookmarks that I can go into my bookmark panel and instantly access, right, in a single click. Even better, I can use things like panel stacks to give users different ways to visualize the same data. So some mm. users are very opinionated about certain types of visualizations, right? But again, it goes to level of sophistication, just personal sure. preferences. Some people like to see a layered line graph versus an area chart versus a stacked bar to analyze that same information. So as a dossier author, I can get frustrated with my constituents arguing <laughs> about, no, 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 I don't want to see that. I want to render this way. So instead, I can create a panel stack that uses the same data, the same dimensions, but I display it in different visualizations and then just label my navigation for the panel uh, to say mm. which visualization type. So now as a business user, not only can I build my own grid, I can pick the type of visualization I want to see. I can use the filter panel to customize the scope of the data with all the right. different filters I can apply. And I could save that as a bookmark. And to me, that's self-service, right? To a business user, it's self-service, but to an author or an application architect, it's governed. It's very safe, yeah. right? There's no way it can be broken. The business user can't accidentally do a cross join and, and <laughs> something disastrous or, you know, give them data that is nonsensical or doesn't make sense. You have the ability to craft those, those custom experiences. And then again, bookmarks can be shared. So exactly. I can you know, take and, and choose my visualizations that I'm using in my panel stacks and create my grid and use my filters. And then I can save that bookmark. I can share it with Kevin. And now Kevin will get that notification in the library. He adds that to his bookmarks. And now he could see my view in a single click. And he also gets the benefit that if I make my view better, uh, his, uh, his bookmark will automatically update. So really, really powerful. Yeah. yeah it's transformative. It, it seems so simple and it is <laughs> so huge. It's really big. Yeah, it's like you as the end user can build your own dossier within a dossier and then send that to your colleagues to collaborate on. Um, and, you know, it's interesting for World, my team built a workshop on a self-service dossier. By far the most popular uh, workshop that we had. I think we had almost 400 people in it. And it was the most simple dossier that I think we put together. But everyone found it really compelling of I can choose what attributes I want. I can choose what metrics and empower those end users. All right, so yeah, it's really, really that combination, right? Of using attribute yeah. and metric selectors in grids in combination with other visualizations, you, you can use attribute and metric selectors for, uh, as well as doing things like panel stacks to allow them to swap in and out visualizations or even even completely different analysis types. But you can build those really compelling self service scenarios uh, that yeah. uh, allow a single dossier to reach a much broader uh, set of personas. Yeah, and you Absolutely. mentioned it before too, but uh, when you're in that consumer persona, you can't break it. No. <laughs> so, you can, so if it's somebody that's timid and is afraid mm. to, to interact, you can really set them at ease and say, go go wild. There's a little reset button at the top left yep. where if you go into so much granular detail that you want to just wipe the slate clean and start over again, there's a magic button for that, you know? Yeah. It's a great way to, again, empower users and also just increase data literacy across your organization of letting people play with the data. See, it's not scary. You can get in there and, and build your own different graphs and grids. Um, I used to work with MicroStrategy as a customer and, and some of the folks I work with were definitely intimidated by it. But giving them this power to click a button and fix it if it doesn't show what they want is absolutely powerful. 
All right. So that was really amazing. Thank you both so much. I'm sure everyone listening has gotten valuable insight in what they can do with application design to take their BI solutions one step further. And, you know, as I think over the next few years, I really think we'll see many organizations move to this application mindset when thinking about analytics, um, and especially with MicroStrategy, I think, Jeff, you touched on this a little bit, but new applications and content groups where you can design an application and send it to a certain group of people. um, So they, you know, have exactly what they need right at their fingertips. And if you ever want to- Yeah, I mean, it really allows for for a a library to have a multi-tenancy sort of experience, right? Where Mm -hmm. you can create multiple applications in a single library server instance. And that way, you know, Kevin goes and he lands on his library homepage and he has all these different things he's, he's using because he's an analyst and he wants to go in and look at a lot of different dossiers where when I land on that particular screen as a business user, I don't even see the library landing screen. I land mm-hmm. on page one of the dossier that is designed just for me and, and people like me that I use every single day. And I know this as, as whatever the name of that application is going to be. So yep. you can design these different application experiences. You can use content groups to sort of govern who gets access to which dossier, different groups, different experiences, all all one platform. So it's it's immensely powerful. Yeah, the application functionality gets me most excited when I think about what it could do for mobile. Oh, yeah. Mm, uh, yeah. I love having my dossier on all devices and have it, you know, hide it, hide certain objects so that it supports one versus the other. But there is sometimes an appetite to just create one distinct mobile app. And yeah. now that we have the application functionality, you open up the library app and it just goes straight to that dossier that is completely built exclusively with the smartphone in mind. That's right. Mm-hmm. And then I go on my laptop and I'm then looking at the library That's interface. Right. And so you do yeah. have the ability to sort of pick and choose based on the persona, based on the device, based on really anything you can dream. Yeah. And one thing we've talked about is how easy some of this is. Um, We've written about it in our classes, not in our SDK or API or customization classes, but our application design classes. It's really easy to go into Workstation and customize that experience. Um, And so speaking of which, if you ever want to learn more or your organization is interested in taking a course on design, definitely reach out to us. We have a lot of courses designed for this specific topic and also embedding and things like that. Um, If you're a current customer, you probably have access to our amazing consulting teams and even our equally amazing UX team led by Jeff. Um, If you're looking to really revamp your design, uh, we are always here to help you succeed. So I'm gonna jump into some Q&A. We have some from social media and YouTube. So give me one sec. All right, let's see what I have here. So I'm showing this question. Um, This is Tim from New York. When should you use the filter panel in library versus in Canvas selectors? Is there a time when you'd use one over another? There is uh, a couple of key things to think about when when it comes to filtering. So the -the out-of-the-box filter panel in library is immensely powerful because you can put all kinds of different filters in there. The filters will apply to everything on the page. And they also will carry that context as you're navigating through the dossier experience. So you can design filters that are specific to one chapter, or you can have filters that go across chapter. And it's really up to the author to figure out which ones would I want as an end user to apply to everything versus which ones are going to be a little more low. And I can structure my page chapter uh, layout, right, to reflect that. The in-canvas selector, in-canvas filters, are going to target one to many visualizations, but they Mm -hmm. give you the ability to specify just this visualization or just these couple visualizations. You can also use selectors to target selectors. So you can build sort of a cascading experience where because I use a selector that shows this value, this selector is gonna change the options that are available to it. You generally wanna use those when you're crafting an experience where I want a level of granularity not applied to the entirety of a page, Mm. but to just specific areas or specific visualizations. So I think that there's uses for both. Generally, when we when we look at things like selecting dates, times, um, we we recommend to put those into the filter panel, because if a user is looking at particular product category or particular date range or particular region, they're probably going to want to see that page by page, right? They want that to carry with them. So you don't want to design an experience where you're replicating the same in-canvas selectors page after page after page, Mm -hmm. right? That 
that's usually a good indication that you're going to want to move that to the filter panel. But if it's a one-time use or in uh, in the self-service scenarios, we saw right. you use attribute metric selectors to build grids. That's a great example of when to put them on Canvas. All right. So we have a question from a longtime customer, Grace, right here in DC asks, when organizations are moving from documents to dossiers, is it a one-on-one -on -one in terms of functionality? So when we set about creating dossier, um, you know, we spent over a decade, right, designing the document engine and documents, right? And it's an incredibly powerful object that you can create application experiences with. And a lot of our customers have uh, really mission critical applications that they built in documents. That's why we brought documents into libraries so that you can mm -hmm. access them and, and again, get those amazing experiences. But when we set about building dossier, it wasn't so much that we were trying to achieve parity, right? Or port everything that was on documents into this sort of new vehicle that represented the future of our, of our platform. Instead, we reimagined those experiences. We reimagined those functions. And so, you know, when you look at documents, are there a couple things maybe that are still out there that documents can do that that uh, dossiers don't? It's probably, um, mm -hmm. but if you were to look at the number of things that dossier and library can do that documents cannot, that yeah. bucket is much, 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 much bigger, right? And so the focus on accessibility, responsiveness, the ability to deploy one thing and have it go everywhere, ease of maintenance, right? All of these things with dossiers are far more powerful, far easier, far more compelling experiences. And uh, documents are still great and we're continuing to, to support support them. Um, but really, dossier and library was our vision of what should authoring and consumption mm. of code enterprise applications be like, right? And that is really, I think, what we're in the sort of the golden age of, yeah. of being able to just build these amazing apps that you can build once, deploy everywhere, uh, you know, allow for, for self-service, allow for these custom experiences, but all of it without writing a single line of code. Yeah, and as, as a consumer or as somebody that's reluctant to make that shift, what I would just remind everybody is, is from an analytics perspective, I've never seen a business question that could be answered using a report services document that couldn't mm. have also been answered through a dossier. Absolutely. Sure. And so, so really, uh, you know, it, the experience is incredibly elegant as, as, a, as a user of dossier, both on the build and consumer experience. And, and I just think, you know, it's it's time to, to get on the dossier train for sure. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> All right. So we have a question from John in the UK. Hi, John. Um, so he asks, can you design an application for mobile users only? Which is interesting because we're talking about build once, deploy everywhere. But what about just deploy for mobile? You absolutely can, right? You absolutely can. You can design a dossier uh, in the responsive view the entire time. Uh, and build a really custom application that's, mm -hmm. you know, just is only going to be consumed on mobile devices. We have a lot of examples of that from our current customers that yep. we've, we've worked with them on to design just a mobile app. Further, now with library applications, you can customize the experience of that, right? So that mm -hmm. just by clicking on the app icon on my phone, I land on page one of this custom mobile app experience. The user may not even know that they're using MicroStrategy or library, right? They just, they're launching this, this yeah. app, right? Whatever you decided to name it. And, and I'm jumping directly into this application experience that's this catered just for a mobile device. Uh, we've done tons of usability testing and research and iteration around all those mobile controls. We have custom gesture controls, swipe controls, right? So much work has gone into it to making these not only incredibly compelling experiences in terms of interacting with the dossier content, but also taking advantage of the best parts of the different mobile platforms so that mm. using that application will feel very familiar to an iOS user versus an Android user, right? Because it uses those native design patterns. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So we just have one more question here, which we kind of talked about with uh, applications, but this is more focused on the branding. Is there an easy way to brand an application? So changing coloring or easily adding logos? Images? Well, the first thing that I do whenever I uh, start working on a proof of concept is I replace the logo <laughs> with the brand of the company. Uh, that I'm working with. So you can absolutely do it there. But let's see, you can create custom color palettes yes. uh, with the application functionality that we have in Workstation. Now you can start to tailor what the library splash screen looks like and really get into those very nuanced uh, personalization decisions. Yeah. 
That's great. Yeah, you can also utilize, if, if you want to go deeper, uh, you can utilize the library SDK uh, mm -hmm. to go in and completely customize the, that entire toolbar and, and make it look however you want it to. And again, even in, in with SDK along with um, with the new library applications, you can also configure, you know, what functionality do you want on and off, right? Yeah. And, and hide or show things to users all based on on the experience you want to create. Yeah, that that's great, guys. And that does it for this session. Um, I just want to say one more time, we have a Dacia UX workshop that I wrote along with Jeff and his team that talks about a lot of these things and how you can design for that end user and putting these best practices into real life. Um, so just want to give a huge thanks to Jeff and Kevin for joining and thank you to everyone watching. We're super excited for this series. So stay tuned for our next connect and see you all soon. And, and just Bye. to know, all the dossiers that you saw today are available in the MicroStrategy demo environment. So everything that we showed, you can go and play with. And we also have in our community, in those areas, some amazing knowledge-based articles, white papers. Uh, a member of my team, King Fu Chu, has done some amazing articles on grid design and responsive design. So I encourage everyone to go read them, use those resources, and just uh, build some amazing apps. Yeah, I second and that. Use the legend. <laughs> it's got some great content out there. So check out demo.microstrategy.com in our Medium blog. I love those articles that he writes. Uh, they are absolutely fantastic. So hope to see you uh, on our websites and on our blog and on the next Connect. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.